Well, the law of God in the Bible, which everybody's concerned about, is not faith in God. What? The law of God is not faith in God. We'll talk about that and more. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Hembert. I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery TV. We are discovering the Bible from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. It's very interesting today. Helping us do this and digest this is Corey and Ryan. Corey, what's happening? I'm going to be taking a look at the book of Romans today and asking specifically why the Apostle Paul even bothered to write the book of Romans. Ryan? Well, Abraham is the subject of Paul's critical discussion about salvation in Romans chapter 4, and so he'll be my subject of discussion as well. Abraham, really? Fascinating. Okay, Janice, what'd you do? Do you believe? Okay, the very good. So get your Bible out and get your Bible guide out as we begin to study it in the book of Romans. This is a great book, by the way, uh, but it's deep, but it's a good book. And let's listen to what God is saying. Romans 4, verses 13 through 25. For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of no effect because the law brings about wrath. For where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all, as it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. In the presence of him whom he believed, God, who gives life to the dead, and calls those things which do not exist as though they did, who, contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken. So shall your descendants be. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. And therefore, it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now, it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but also for us. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him, who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. Romans chapter 4, verses 13 through 25. Romans chapter 3 and 4. This is a very important passage of Scripture, and I want to encourage you to join us as we continue to read it. You see, there is a persistent problem between faith and the law. There is. And many, they do not and will not believe in faith. Did, did I say that right? Yes, I did. But they find it easy to see and hear the law of God the law, the law, the law. The problem is that Jesus Christ told us that many would be closed or rather close to the law and not close to him as their Lord. Also in the book of Revelation, chapter three, verse 20, the Bible says to the church of Laodiceans, this is the lazy church, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Now, this is a reference to the church that's lukewarm and not truly serving God. God is knocking on the door of the church. And Paul is attempting to get the people in Rome 
to know the difference between serving a set of laws and serving the living and true God. And let me tell you something. There is a very, very big difference. Now get your Bible guide and turn to today's passage. Again, I would remind you, I want to encourage you that uh, if you don't have your Bible guide, I want to encourage you to write for yours or call. The phone number and the address are on the bottom of the page, bottom of this video uh, page here that you see. Or another way you can do this is go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com. And when you go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com, uh, you can click on that and uh, it'll take you to donate page and you can donate. Thank you so much for your donations. We very much appreciate them and they're necessary. So they keep the lights going around here and the cameras rolling and the TV monitors on and so on. So that helps us and, and it's the only source of income we truly have. So thank you. But uh, it'll take you then to a PDF file page where you can download the pages just like they're printed. Uh, and it's very, very good. So you're seconds away from this righteousness of faith. What am I talking about? The righteousness of faith, Romans 4. This is interesting, you know, when you begin to look at chapter 4. And Father, I pray today as we look at the righteousness of faith, that you would show us your ways and teach us your paths. Because we know, Lord, that you speak to us and speak through your word. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Chapter 4, verse 13 says, as Paul talks to the church at Rome, for the promise that he would be their heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law. The promise that he would be their heir of the world was not to Abraham or his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith, the rightness of God of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of no effect because the law brings about wrath or anger for where there is no law there is no transgression now this is interesting here we begin to see paul explains that the law is not faith but we are called through faith to follow jesus christ through faith to follow jesus christ now when we do that jesus christ fulfilled the law so we tend to change our life, change our way of thinking, change our friends, change things. Because we're following Jesus Christ and he is the Lord of our life. That becomes very important. Now, Romans chapter 4, verse 16 helps us to clarify some of this. He says in verse 16, Therefore it is of faith that it might be according to grace. Therefore it is of faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of faith, of Abraham, <laughs> who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. In the presence of him whom he believed, God, who gives life, God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist, though they did, who contrary to hope, in hope believe, so that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. Now, a big sentence, but Paul explains that Abraham's faith made him God's choice as father of many nations. His faith made him God's choice as father of many nations. We must trust in God through faith to succeed as a Christian. Christians don't succeed by adhering to the law of God all the time. But we succeed by following Jesus and understanding that we have to follow God by knowing Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior. Now, let's go to verse uh, or four, or chapter 4, verse 19. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body, already dead since he was about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. 
He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. And therefore, it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now, it was not written for his sake alone, beloved, that it was imputed to him. But also for us, it shall be imputed to us who believe in him, who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. Wow, that's a big sentence. But what is he saying? He's saying, in spite of everything against his faith, Abraham trusted in God. As Christians, we will be tested in life. Do we believe that God will keep his promises? Do you believe God will keep his promises? Let me tell you something. I believe he will. And we need to come to Jesus Christ and we need to say that. We need to say, Lord, forgive me of my sin. I believe you because I think that you are Lord. Now, Lord, help me to believe that through the Holy Spirit. And so, Father, I come to you and I ask you one thing. Help me to live my life according to your Holy Spirit in Jesus' wonderful name. And we said together, all of us said together, amen, because this becomes very important that we have to understand we seek God through his strength, not through our own strength. So we need to understand that, beloved. So today, as we think that through as Christians, as believers, Let's remember that God has told us through the scripture that we should do that. That in spite of everything against his faith, Abraham trusted God. And as Christians, we will be tested in life. Do we believe that God will keep his promises? In fact, I do. I believe God will keep his promises. What about you? Hi, Rod Hembry. We go through the Bible in one year. It's exciting. It's great. And you can join us by searching Bible Discovery TV on your phone. That's right. On your phone, your iPhone or your Android phone. And when you do so, you'll find the app. You can download the app and watch it anytime you want. Never miss a program right here on Bible Discovery TV. We'll see you there. So today we're beginning our study in the New Testament book of Romans. So I want to take a minute to uh, look into the reasoning behind the Apostle Paul writing the book of Romans in the first place. We know that it was originally a letter addressed to the church in Rome, to those Christians in Rome, but Paul hadn't as of yet traveled to Rome. So this, this you know, marks this book, this New Testament book, as different from his other epistles that he was writing to churches, to people that he already had relationships with, that he had already visited their cities. So why Romans? Let's find out. The book of Romans is believed to be the sixth New Testament book written by the Apostle Paul. Romans is also the only biblical letter that Paul wrote to a church that he had not founded nor even visited prior to his writing. The reason Paul wrote to Rome is explained in Romans chapter 15. Paul is aiming to launch a new missionary journey, this time in the western half of the Roman Empire. He is traveling from the area of Macedonia and Achaia to Jerusalem, then hopes to go to Rome and stay with the church before departing on a western missionary journey that he hoped would reach Spain. Due to this outline, the book of Romans has been dated to AD 57 and would correspond with the history of Acts chapter 20. From the rest of Acts, we know that Paul was arrested in Jerusalem and eventually brought to Rome. Whether he was released to complete his missionary journey to Spain is a debated topic. Paul's plan to visit Rome goes a long way in explaining the book's generalized nature. His other books focus largely on situations and issues that have risen up in that specific place that he's writing to. With Rome, however, he's afforded the opportunity to introduce his teaching and give an overview of the gospel. Paul stylistically adds in hypothetical objections to his teaching, along with his answers. There was, however, one situation that everyone would have known of that Paul decided to address in Romans. The expulsion of all Jews from Rome by order of Emperor Claudius in AD 49. 
It's mentioned in Acts 18 and recorded by Roman historian Suetonius, who blames the expulsion of the Jews on a riot over Crestus, generally believed to mean ongoing fighting between Christian Jews and Jews. After Claudius' death five years later, Jews were allowed back into Rome. For the Christian church, this would have meant that for five years, the church was strictly Gentile. Any vacated leadership positions would have been assumed by them. Then, in AD 54, they would have become mixed again. Three years later, we have Paul writing Romans, discussing not only the gospel, but also Jewish-Gentile relations. You know, Rome was a really interesting place and it would not have been the easiest place to be an early Christian. Uh, and Paul knew this. And I think it's really interesting to look at how he structures the book of Romans and how it is different than his other epistles. Not that it contains different theology, but just his outline of the book of Romans uh, is very coordinated. It's very put together and it just gives a there's a different appreciation that I have for the Apostle Paul and for his theology when I take a look at Romans and I compare it with some of his other epistles. You know, it's interesting. He, he makes the statement that he wants to go to Rome. And of course, at the end of his ministry, he does. He does. But he's under prison. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is absolutely stunning because he writes this letter that's well established and mm -hmm. well theologically developed. And uh, it's, but it's very hard to understand and read if you don't take time and read it. Yeah, yeah, you know, it, it kind of introduces Paul and his theology and it serves as, you know, a preparatory letter before he goes in so that they all know who he is and they all know exactly what he's, he's trying to establish. But yeah, it, you know, that you have to spend time even still uh, with the book of Romans to fully digest it. In the Roman Empire's seat, you know, the capital city, that's where he's writing to. It's very interesting. And imagine getting this letter as a Christian in Rome and knowing that he was going to visit and that you were going to be able to ask him all sorts of questions about it. Yeah, that, that's, that would be cool. That's really interesting. <laughs> really interesting. Okay, right? Yeah, well, you know, our reading assignment is Romans chapters 3 and 4. And here, Paul gives an awesome testimony about how a Christian salvation comes through faith in Jesus Christ alone. And he uses Abraham as the prime example. And since Abraham is mentioned 19 different times throughout Paul's letters, I thought it would be helpful to remind ourselves of that very essential history. So let's study the life of this great man of God from his initial calling out of Haran to the miraculous birth of his son Isaac. His name was Abram. And though he was raised in a nation that served other gods, he was about to become his own nation under God, the one true God. Indeed, in his 75th year, he departed from Haran and from his father Terah's house, as God had commanded him, to journey to an unknown land. With him was his wife Sarai and nephew Lot, plus all the people and possessions he acquired in Haran. When they came to a land called Canaan, God appeared to Abram there and promised the land to his future descendants. During the next several years, God would continually reaffirm this promise to Abram and even add to it. Not only would his descendants inherit the land, but one day Abram would as well. And not only would one nation come from Abram, but many. In fact, his descendants would be as innumerable as the dust of the earth and the stars of the heavens. And most significant of all, all nations would one day be blessed through him. To emphasize the promise, God changes his name from Abram, meaning exalted father, to Abraham, the father of a multitude. Likewise, Sarai was now to be called Sarah. Despite these many promises, there was still one major problem. As Abraham himself pointed out, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? Indeed, his wife was barren, and they were now both of great age. Nevertheless, God promises Abraham that his heir would come from his own loins, and Abraham believes him. However, after 10 years removed from Haran, the couple is getting concerned. Abraham is now 85 and Sarah 75. So in desperation, Sarah gives Abraham her Egyptian handmaid, Hagar, in order to obtain children by her. Although at this point in time, God had not yet specifically revealed to Abraham that Sarah was going to be the mother of the promised heir, it should have been assumed since she was his only wife. Nevertheless, through the union of Abraham and Hagar came Ishmael. And as far as Abraham knew, this was the promised son. It would have come as quite a shock, therefore, 
when God returned to Abraham 14 years later to reveal that Sarah would bear the actual promised son in a year's time. Though truly miraculous, in the following year, which was now 25 years after they had left Haran, their promised son was born. Abraham was 100 and Sarah was 90. As God had instructed, they called him Isaac, meaning laughter. It was truly a time of joy and celebration. However, during a feast in Isaac's honor, Sarah saw Ishmael mocking Isaac, which ultimately led to his expulsion from the family. Though this tremendously grieved Abraham, God consoled him through the revelation that Ishmael would also become a great nation, but that Isaac was the promised covenant son. Indeed, it would be through Isaac that God's nation, Israel, would come. So while Abraham, like all of us, wasn't perfect, ultimately he trusted and believed in God's promises, and God accounted Abraham's faith unto righteousness. In other words, his trust in God is what saved him. And that's Paul's point. A Christian salvation isn't a result of works, nor is it a result of faith plus works, lest we should boast. Our salvation comes through faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. Now, I will say that if we are truly saved, then works should follow. It's like James says in James chapter 2, faith without works is dead. You know, I heard one pastor describe salvation this way. It's not faith plus works equals salvation. It's faith equals salvation plus works. Salvation cannot be earned. It's a free gift to anyone who believes on the Lord Jesus Christ and trusts in his work on the cross for your sins. Isn't that great news? And by the way, this idea of salvation through faith alone is one of the major differences between Christianity and most, if not all, of the other world religions. With other religions, salvation is works-based to some capacity. Very important to understand that difference. I think that's really important, and uh, that is the one thing that makes Christianity different. We serve mm -hmm. a risen Savior, somebody who's alive. And secondly, it's not by our work that we achieve yeah. to be God's best. Yeah, you know? that's right. God himself has made us whole. He's the one who's made us best, if you would, to be able to ex be accepted by him. Janice? Thank you for pointing Abraham out. Um, because that's really what chapter four is talking about. Paul mm -hmm. is talking about Abraham justified by faith. And he goes through this description, which is why I decided to title my segment today, Do You Believe? Because it is a question that we each have to answer in our own lives. Do we believe what Jesus said? Do we believe that he is the way, the truth, and the life? Do we believe that he is the only begotten son of God who came to the earth, who gave himself... Um, gave his life on the cross to pay for our sins, and then three days later rose from the dead. Do we believe that? Do I, do you believe that? As Abraham, at a time in his life where his body was, let's say, dead to be able to make a child, and so was Sarah. In, in that old age, Abraham was around 100 years old. There was no possible way for him to be what God had told him that he would be, the father of many nations. But yet Abraham chose to believe what God was calling him to do. Do we believe what the word of God says? Romans 6 verse 22, the wages of sin is death, is death but the gift of God is eternal life. Can God take my life dead in sin and raise it up so that I can be reborn into life and life eternal that when I pass from this life, I pass into the arms of Jesus Christ to live with him forever eternally. Do I believe that? or don't I? These are the things that we need to be asking ourselves and searching. And you may be out there saying, well, I, I think I believe, I, I, I'm trying to believe. Be like that father in the story in Mark chapter nine, in verse 24, we'll read what he says to Jesus, but he comes and he wants to have faith because his son needs to be healed. He wants Jesus to be able to heal his son and he believes that he can. And Jesus says in your faith that he will be made well. And the father says to him, immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. God knows your heart. And I'm so thankful that God does. I'm thankful that God doesn't judge us the way we judge one another by outward appearances. God knows what's going on in your heart. 
be honest with God today. Open up to him. And if you haven't met him, if you haven't called out to him to save you, to be your Lord and to be your Savior, do that today. Make that important step. Come to him today. He is waiting. He's waiting to, to turn your life from death into reborn new life, newness of life with Jesus Christ. Because when you're born, that's one thing in the flesh, but to be born again mm -hmm. was what Jesus was talking about in John chapter three when he talked to Nicodemus. Nicodemus is to your spirit to be born again, like you're Come saying. Come alive, yes. And God rescues your spirit. Mm -hmm. And when he does that, suddenly you, there are two things that happen. Number one, you're forgiven of sin and from the damages of hell, but, but you also have eternal life. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's really important. So when death comes around, we are ready for seeing Jesus Christ face to face because whatever we don't see in this life, suddenly we'll begin to see in our spirit and our spirit is alive because Jesus Christ makes us alive. Only through Jesus Christ, only by believing in Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, the Son of God, that's the only way we can do it. So come to the Lord today, come to Jesus Christ. He's waiting for you. Thank you for joining us today in the program. As we come to the end, I want to remind you that we have prayer meetings on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. That's Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, live on Facebook, YouTube, and Bible Discovery TV at 3.30 to 4.30. That's Eastern time, or that's New York time in North America. We have people from all over the world. So join us there. Right now, let's pray. Lord, help me to have faith in what you have promised in the name of Jesus Christ, and all of us said together, make it so, or amen.